Hachi, a corgi who pulverizes demons. This is an actual line in a game trailer. Bloodstain is quickly finding its way in as a new franchise from Igarashi as a spiritual successor to Castlevania. Not only for the excellent Ritual of the Night, which I covered last year, but also for Curse of the Moon, which was a throwback to classic Castlevania. Which is, uh, also fantastic, by the way. But out of nowhere, Inti Creates announced that Curse of the Moon was getting a sequel, and it was coming out in less than a month. <laughs> I mean, excuse me, what? I mean, this isn't the first time they've done something like this, but it definitely caught me off guard. So with a very short hype cycle, I was excited to hop right in and see what we had in store. And what are the results? Let's find out. Also, there might be slight gameplay spoilers, but I'm not going to show anything that wasn't in the trailers and such. Anyway, the story is very much in the background as Engetsu is out to slay more demons, but this time joining him is Dominique from Ritual of the Night, and boy is he glad these are separate timelines, Robert, a soldier sniper, and Hachi, a corgi that controls a giant mech. No, I didn't make that up. If you played Curse of the Moon or any classic Castlevania, you know what to expect. Platform your way through levels using your sub-weapons, fight the boss at the end, and move on. The big thing with Curse of the Moon is that it has a partner system from Castlevania 3, only taken a step further. While Zengetsu has his sword, anti-air whip, attack buff, and fireball, Dominique has a variety of spells she can cast, including a once per level skill that can revive everyone in the party, and use her lance as attacks from long range, or to be used as a pogo stick. Robert can use his rifle to attack from a distance, he can crawl on the floor and wall jump, and he has a variety of long range specials but has a much lower health bar. And Hachi has the highest health, a hover ability, a ground stomp, but he doesn't have extra sub weapons. Instead, he can become completely invincible for a short period of time, though it drains your magic like crazy, so use it sparingly. All the characters have separate health bars, but share a pool of magic. If a character dies, you continue from the last screen, but that character can't be revived until one of three things happen. You beat the level, you use that revived spell I mentioned, or when all of your characters die, which makes you lose a life, and you're sent back to your last checkpoint, these candlesticks pretty much. And that's where a lot of the challenge comes from, making sure you can keep your party alive because if you keep them up, you can use their special abilities to find alternate paths that can be used as shortcuts for the levels, or to find permanent power-ups, like health, attack, defense, or magic boosts. And keeping them alive for boss fights is also key, not only for the advantages to each, but it also gives you more chances on the fight. If you die on a boss fight, part of their health will be removed to make up for all the work that you did on your last attempt. Also, the bosses this time have health bars, which helps for last second decision making and planning, so thank you for that. But if you lose a life, you gotta fight the entire boss all over again. Though bosses in general are challenging but never impossible to overcome. Using your character's attributes and pattern recognition are key, and if you dodge their desperation move, you score an extra life. These moves can't kill you, by the way, it's all for spectacle. But that only really matters if you're playing on veteran difficulty, which is considered the normal mode. But if you'd like, the game also has a casual mode, where you get more magic, enemies don't hit as hard, you have infinite lives, and probably the biggest boon, no knockback, and in this kind of a game, that's a big deal. The game doesn't penalize you for picking one mode over the other, so do whatever feels fair to you. But being fair, I don't think lives are that big of an issue. Mainly by having the other characters, you got yourself a built-in safety net. And even when fighting the bosses, I tended to get a life around the same time all my characters would die. So it's not too punishing, but you will have to be on your guard. And that's a trait that Curse of the Moon 2 has right. It was punishing for sure, but excluding a few exceptions, I didn't find it archaic or too reliant on trial and error. Every time I beat a level, there was a great feeling of satisfaction that followed that kept me going throughout my multiple playthroughs. Yes, I said multiple playthroughs. If you played Curse of the Moon 1, you might be familiar with this. But after your first playthrough, you'll need to venture back in, but with Robert and Hachi at your side from the beginning of the game, allowing you to take new paths and fight a new final boss. However, on Episode 3, you actually get access to all the characters from Curse of the Moon 1, including Miriam, star of Ritual of the Night and this game's Belmont with a whip and powerful sub-weapons, Alfred, whose magic is unparalleled, and Jeeble, who has a powerful angled attack and can turn himself into a bat to bypass obstacles. And they have passed in levels that only they can take that you weren't able to take advantage of the first time, leading to entire new parts of the level that you haven't been to, 
and forming new strategies since you can't rely on the same tricks that you used before because of the different power sets. It changed how I played the game drastically and made it almost feel like an entirely new adventure, which was awesome. And after that, you get the final episode, which sort of pays homage to the more Metroidvania style of progression. You're able to play any of the levels in any order you wish, but certain levels have power-ups to collect and a new party member that are permanently added after being that level. Meaning you can get to a point where you have all seven characters playable at once, and that... That's incredible. This episode alone changes so much depending on what order you do, which makes it easily the most interesting one to come back to, and certain paths will require multiple characters to take advantage of, leading to big rewards. The fact that I was playing this game four times in a row, and still finding out new tactics and parts of the levels, is a testament to the design of the game, and leads to an insane amount of replayability. I haven't even collected everything yet and got 8 plus hours of playtime. I was happy to play as all the characters from Curse of the Moon 1 again as they transition to this game perfectly. But Hachi honestly might be my favorite in the whole game. For one, he's a corgi in a mech and that's just amazing. But he can also take a lot of punishment and because he only has one sub weapon, every drop that is in a heart will be magic, filling up the gauge fast. The hover is great for platforming and is a great way to dodge attacks, and that invincibility is a lifesaver for figuring out strategies against bosses or getting through levels. You'd be amazed how much this can turn the tide in your favor in certain sections, and it somehow still doesn't feel broken either, which is commendable. So yes, he's a very good boy. The entire game also has local co-op to add even more replay value. Sadly, I wasn't able to try it out in time for this review, but if you want to try it for yourself, have at it. The sprite work is still great, capturing that NES style while giving it its own unique touch, mainly on the bosses who look fantastic and are easily the highlights of the presentation, along with the soundtrack that remains fitting to every environment while still staying catchy and setting the mood perfectly. I even love the in-between parts of levels, where you get animation showing your team just hanging out. These were a great sense of charm, and kind of remind me of the Kirby's Adventure animations. I don't know if that was intentional or not, that's just what my mind went to. I did have a few issues with the game though. For one, I gotta say, the second episode felt kind of forced in this game, because all you get are Zengetsu, Robert, and Hachi. So you're only missing Dominique, who I didn't use that much anyway unless she was needed, so the only real change is that you have the other two earlier for like, four levels. And then it's the same as last time, with the only change being the final boss, which is the same boss you fight in Episode 3. This one just felt like padding, and I see no reason to come back to it in the future. I know Curse of the Moon 1 did a similar thing, but this one felt even more forced thanks to the addition of the later episodes. Speaking of Dominique, I don't really like how her paths are set up, because they all focus around her pogo move. Unlike other games with a similar type of move, you can't adjust yourself mid-air, so you need to get your spacing perfect on them, otherwise you're not getting that path. And these lanterns don't respawn, adding to the problem. Most other characters get some leeway in their paths, but not for her which made me dread every time they came up. Once I got Jeebel, I used him for these sections instead, because I had much more of a safety net with him. I did feel like a few of the levels had some checkpoints that were a little too far back. Nothing that would stop me from playing, but level 6 had a boss that wasn't too clear on the first time and the checkpoint was like 4 or 5 rooms back, so if your entire team bit the dust, you have to make a lot of time up. Like have it 2 rooms before at minimum. It doesn't help that the shortcut on the first run requires Dominique, which comes with all the trappings that I just mentioned. Level 5 was a really weird difficulty spike. I honestly think this was one of the hardest levels in the game on the first run. Like this honestly should have been the second to final level in my opinion, for both the level and the boss. While the boss got easier when I figured out the pattern, it was a lot to figure out on the first time. And the final level has one gimmick that just kinda ruins the whole thing. It's an already hard level, but you got this big orb following you that you need to keep attacking to send it back and a lot of the time you end up getting sandwiched between that and another enemy, and yeah, I switched to casual mode for this level. I was not having it. And it's only on episode 1 that this shows up. Every other time, the level's perfectly fine. Which just kind of cements it's only hard because of this gimmick. While I do love the versatility of all the characters, I did think that Dominique and Robert were the two I found myself using the least. 
Dominique was okay on the first run, but I think she gets a little too outclassed by Miriam and Alfred to be of much use other than her being able to attack straight up. And Robert? Poor Robert, he is easily the most situational character in the game. In the times where he shines, he's great, but everywhere else, he just fires too slow and his sub weapons don't pack enough of a punch. Plus, he really can't take that much punishment. Yeah, his range is good, but when I can get more done with the sub weapons from the other characters in a game where magic isn't hard to get, it makes Robert a lot less useful. Maybe if he could shoot straight up or at an angle with his standard shot, that could change things, but as of now, eh, I didn't use him much. But those aren't enough to bring down a great package with a ton of replayability and a fair challenge for 15 bucks that will keep you coming back for more. It's great for both veterans and for those looking to get into Classic Vania. Honestly, both Circle of the Moons are fantastic starting points in my opinion, though I do think 2 is overall the better game. I was very happy with the result, and it shows that the Curse of the Moon franchise isn't just a one-trick pony. Curses may be seen as bad, but this is one you want to keep around.